Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Haley Pollock. I'm the host of the Kitchen Table Reading Series. Welcome to my my kitchen. I couldn't convince these other food, these other folks to <laughs> go to their kitchens. It sounded too chaotic in the house. Uh, you might see my children from time to time. Um, and I, Tina says we we might be able to watch Black Panther if, uh, or we might be able to hear Black Panther. <laughs> um, Thank you for taking the time to, to spend your, your Sunday afternoon um, and, and late morning, depending on where you are uh, with us today. Uh, I've lined up four poets for you, um, and we'll proceed alphabetically. Dilruba Ahmed, uh, Tina Kane, Marcus Jackson, and Philip B. Williams. Uh, before we start, I had a couple quick notes, so uh, I'm gonna let, let our poets go for a second. We also have Amber, our ASL interpreter, um, with us today. Uh, I'm gonna let everyone except Amber go for a sec. Or if you guys could just stop your video. Great. Um, and <laughs> true to form in these readings, my cat just showed up in, in the reading. You'll probably see my kids later. Uh, the idea of this series as the, um, the metaphor of the kitchen table suggests is that it, it breaks through the usual conventions uh, and formality of a poetry reading and to the work that poets are, are sharing works of others and, and their own works uh, a little more intimately and unpretentiously with you. Uh, my original intention back in June was to keep promotion to a minimum and to make this as non-commercial as, as possible, but then I had a realization and faced the reality. The realization was that the poets got to eat uh, and buying books, your buying books helps them eat. Um, so during the reading, I'll, I'll post in the chat um, the most recent book from each uh, poet. And uh, if, if you're so inclined, I hope you'll help and, and consider supporting these, these readers. Um, the reality was that while I like to keep art and, and commerce separate, um, technology and commerce are very thoroughly intertwined. And these webcasting and video conferencing platforms are, are expensive. Uh, and that expense sort of um, explains the, the hiatus between the first reading in June and, and now. Luckily, um, my colleagues, um, Meg Carney and Quentin Collins came through, my colleagues from the Solstice MFA program came through and stepped in to, to partner with me and help provide the, the platform for future readings. So I'm once again very thankful to the Solstice MFA program um, it's a place where I go to, to recharge both emotionally and, and creatively, um, being part of that diverse community that is open in spirit, um, but very serious about, about writing, um, sustains me. Um, so if you're interested in pursuing a master's degree in, in fine arts and creative writing, whether it's poetry, fiction, or nonfiction, um, I hope you'll take a look at us. Um, these have obviously been some, some hard days. I had, uh, originally intended to dedicate this uh, reading to my colleague from, from Solstice, Randall Keenan, who, who died suddenly um, recently. Um, I, was, I was glad to see that Randall was just nominated for a National Book Award for his recent, um, his recent short story collection. Um, also one of my favorite musicians, Toots Hibbert of Toots and the May Tales, um, died in, in Jamaica last weekend. So I was um, anticipating honoring them with this reading, but then of course, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. So I also wanted to um, um, dedicate part of this reading to her. And I, I hope that I live my life with the insightfulness, joyfulness, and, and righteousness of, of that, that trio. Um, before we, before Dilruba reads, I just wanted to start off with a Naomi Shahib Nye poem. Um, I'm also a high school teacher. I teach 10th and 11th grade English, and I'm just starting to head back to school now. And so I'm gonna send out this poem to uh, all the teachers out there as we start what is undoubtedly the strangest school year of, of our careers. Rain. A teacher asked Paul what he would remember from third grade. And he sat a long time before writing this year, somebody touched me on the shoulder and turned his paper in. Later, she showed it to me as an example of her wasted life. 
The words he wrote were large as houses in a landscape. He wanted to go inside them and live. He could fill in the windows of O and D and be safe while outside, birds building nests in drain pipes knew nothing of the coming rain. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna call Dilruba Ahmed up. Uh, Dilruba is one of my best friends in, in poetry. I'm so happy that she's reading with us. She's, she lives in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Take it away, Dilruba. Thank you so much, Ian, for that lovely welcome and uh, an introduction. I, um, uh, I'd also like to say thanks to Megan, LeDuc, and everyone at the Solstice MFA program, and to Amber for interpreting to us today. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us on a uh, stunning, well, at least here on the East Coast, a stunningly beautiful Sunday afternoon uh, at, at a really difficult uh, moment in time. <clears throat> um, I'm really honored to be reading and participating in this event today with Tina and Marcus and Philip. I have six poems to share, and um, they, uh, these first three are, are by poets I admire very much, and I, I've chosen poems that, um, that took me by surprise in some way. Uh, this first poem is Drought by Tracy K. Smith. Drought, and this is section one from a three-part sequence. Drought. The hydrangea begins as a small, bright world. Mother buries rusty nails and the flowers weep blue and pink. I am alone in the garden, and like all else that is living, I lean into the sun. Each bouquet will cringe and die in time while the dry earth watches. It is ugly, and the earth is ugly to allow it. Still, the petals curl and drop. Mother calls it an exquisite waste, but there is no choice. I learn how. Before letting go, open yourself completely. Wait. When the heavens fail to heavens, wither and bend. This next one is a poem by Camille Dungy, and it's called Flight. It is the day after the leaves when buckeyes like a thousand thousand pendulums clock trees and squirrels fat in their winter fur, chuckle hours, chortle days. It is the time for the parting of our ways. You slid into the summer of my sleeping, crept into my lonely hours, ate the music of my dreams. You filled yourself with the treated sweet I offered then shut your rolling eyes and stole my sleep. Came morning and me awake, came morning. Awake, I walked 12 miles to the six gun shop. On the way there, I saw a bird of prayer all furled up by the river. I called to it, it would not unfold. On the way home, I killed it. It is the time of the waking cold when buckeyes like a thousand thousand metronomes talk time and you fat on my summer sleep titter toward me walk away it is the time for the parting of our days and this third poem that i'm sharing is by amy nez it's called sea church give me a church made entirely of salt let the walls hiss and smoke when i return to shore I ask for the grace of a new freckle on my cheek, the lift of blue and my mother's soapy skin to greet me. Hide me in a room with no windows. Never let me see the dolphins leaping into commas for this water prayer, rising like a host of paper lanterns in the inky evening. Let them hang in the sky until they vanish at the edge of the constellations, the heroes and animals too busy and bright to notice. Okay, and then I have three poems of mine to share. The first one is called Phase One. For leaving the fridge open last night, I forgive you. For conjuring white curtains instead of living your life. 
for the seedlings that wilt now in tiny pots, I forgive you for saying no first, but yes, as an afterthought. I forgive you for hideous visions after childbirth brought on by loss of sleep. And when the baby woke repeatedly for your silent rebuke in the dark, what's your beef? I forgive you for letting vines overtake the man, or fearing your propensity to love, for losing again your bag and route from San Francisco, for the equally heedless drive back on the caffeine-fueled return. I forgive you for leaving windows open in rain and soaking library books again, for putting forth only revisions of yourself with punctuation worked over instead of the disordered truth, I forgive you. For singing mostly when the shower drowns your voice. For so admiring the drummer, you failed to hear the drum. In forgotten tin cans, may forgiveness gather, pooling in gutters, gushing from pipes, a great steady rain of olives from branches, relieved of cruelty and petty meanness. With it, a flurry of wings, 13 gray pigeons, ointment reserved for healers and prophets. I forgive you, I forgive you. For feeling awkward and nervous without reason. For bearing Keats' empty vessel with such calm, you worried you had perhaps no moral center at all. For treating your mother with contempt when she deserved compassion. I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you for growing a capacity for love that is great, but matched only perhaps by your loneliness, for being unable to forgive yourself first so you could then forgive others and at last find a way to become the love that you want in this world. Um, this next poem is called Bring Now the Angels. Bring now the angels to test your pulse as you sleep. Bring the healer, the howler, the listening ear. Bring an apothecary to mix the tincture. We need the salve, the tablet, the capsule of the hour. Bring sword eaters and those who will swallow fire. Fetch the guardian to flatten the wheelchair to hoist it toward heaven. The public shuttle awaits the ceaseless trips to the clinic. To the bedside manner, summon witness. This medic's disdain toward patients, the physician's dismissal of pain, and call the druggist again to drug us senseless. Bring a nomad to index our debts. Tuck each invoice into broken walls of regret. Call the cleric, the clerk, the messengers divine. Summon someone collect the prayers, buried or burnt, sunk in seas, dunked underwater until all dissolves. Bring now the scribe, let it be written. There is no shepherd, no Sherpa, no moonlight guide for these, the darkest journey of our lives. Who will lift the shuttle above the outposts of the living? Who will watch it rise and rise? Who will clear a path among all the wreckage? Who will weave a nest for all the birds of passage? Who will bridge the gap between savage and salvage? Who will sing over wilting stalks, rough husks, silk still gleaming like hair in a dream? And for my final poem, um, I'm reading some new work. Uh, this one was inspired by a quote uh, from Carl Jung. And the quote is, you are afraid to open the door. I too was afraid since we had forgotten that God is terrible. Christ taught God is love, but you should know that love is also terrible. And the poem is called, According to Your Word. I did not know then God is darkness, the illumination of which sears eyes like sunlight. Only when the sting subsided could I appreciate the intricate afterimage crocheted upon my lens. Transformations fretwork, 
so that what I thought love grows dim and what I once thought shadow now radiates an endless light. I could have rejected this burning as nothing but branding for cattle. I want to look upon paintings of Mary as the archangel delivers the news and argue we cannot know whether her hand raised slightly, so slightly, signals her ascent or descent. How demure she seems. Could she dare lift a hand to stop the will of God? Or did she embrace the news with holy indifference? Did a voice urge, don't be afraid? Or was there nothing but raw pulse and breath? What recourse does anyone have when the unknown angel approaches, glittering with divine grace, but to utter the word that surfaces first? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Daruba. Um, I love that for the forgiveness poem to become the love that ends to become the love that you want in this world. That's that's the goal, uh, isn't it? Um, thank you for those those poems. I was excited to hear your new work uh, as well. I haven't heard that poem yet. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and thanks for sharing, um, especially the Camille Dungy. I'm I've I've really gotten into her work um, recently. If, if folks are looking for uh, another poet to to read these days. Um, next, we have Tina Kane. So I'm going to call Tina Kane up to the stage. Can you hear me? Am I up? Yeah, just one second. Oh, yes, there you are. Hi, Tina. Uh, and Tina, you're in Providence, Rhode Island, is that right? Yeah, just outside of Providence. Just right? outside of Providence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tina Kane, go for it. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you everyone for inviting me and um, thank you Amber for interpreting. It's interesting to watch hand movement um, paired with words. So I'm really happy to be here and um, I'm going to share um, a poem by John Ashbery. It's a poem that I love called Some Trees. And then actually the other day I was just reading Dennis Smith's uh, book Homey and he has um, a poem called Trees, which is you know, around the same subject, but so it's completely different that um, I, uh, I kind of want to teach them in tandem. But this is a poem I go back to often called Some Trees by John Ashford. These are amazing, each joining a neighbor as though speech were still a performance, arranging by chance to meet as far as this morning from the world as agreeing with it. You and I are suddenly what the trees try to tell us we are. That their merely being there means something. That soon we may touch, love, and explain. And glad not to have invented such comeliness, we are surrounded. A canvas on which emerges a chorus of smiles, a winter morning. Placed in a puzzling light and moving, our days put on such reticence. These accents seem their own defense. Um, so that, that poem stays a little mysterious to me, so I return to it often. And, um, now I'm gonna read some of my work. I'm gonna read from this book, Once More with Feeling, which is very much a New York City book. I grew up in downtown New York. And this first poem is called Wish List. And I always say that these are actual wishes of mine. Wish list. To be the Mary J. Blige of poetry. To come back as Peter O'Toole. To have Peter Falk expose his tender heart to you as John Cassavetes would make a monument to love to a fragile wife with a nervous tick and strangers from a bar on the couch. To be a poet of the sea, pounding down each syllable till it resembles almost nothing but sound between lovers. To be an unscripted scene of oneself, have a teardrop tattoo inked beneath one eye. To practice right action and right speech. 
to summon a stiff drink upon waking at the foot of a dune, to be a grain of sand in that dune, to be seen up close at maximum magnification, intricate and entirely positive. So in this book, there's um, a bunch of poems called Minor Histories, and um, like there's Minor History of Bodega and um, of the East Village. Um, but I'm going to read um, a minor history of police work. And um, there's a name in this poem, Diana, and that is the name of the four-year-old girl who was in the car with her mom and her mom's boyfriend, Philando Castillo, who was murdered by a police officer in the car. And so that's the reference to Diana. A minor history of police work. I am trying to live in a clear-headed tenderness that I could afford to be disorganized, defiant, delinquent even back then when others could not, cannot still, maybe never will. I was a kid when the cops tried to take me from my home to the station for my safety. I was several years older than Diana in that car who watched a bullet wound bloom in the driver's seat on the screen cradled in her mother's palm. Her story now replaying as the blood expands like a hand across the young man's torso over and over, a small shadow falling across his ripped white tank. Nothing so red as that fixed for a lifetime in my eye until now. Nothing like that back then until now. I see how memory serves, may work for her, and I grieve. When I said I was safe, the cops didn't make me go, that I could not be forced, so rooted to the basement apartment that was my home. Not a car, but a room with bars on the window and a gate to the street. We didn't own a vehicle, didn't drive. My father was white, my mother was Chinese, and the police were nice to us, tried to break things up, though their presence in our home meant broken. They let me stay. No one was speeding or failing to signal. After all, we were just failing in a loud and crazy time. And whatever else we couldn't afford, we could still afford to fail. We worked with what we had, and they let us. Um, so I'm going to read some poems now from um, this other book, Body of Work, and um, I'm just going to read one short poem from there, and then I'm going to read some new work. Um, this poem is called Luck. There was a time when I'd say things like, that shit broke, about a toaster I had or something in a story I had read, and the boy I'd be with would laugh and shake his head like he couldn't believe his luck or some such feeling I still can't name, but which broke me a little all the same. The way we do at different times when we are young or not so young, how we cleave ourselves open to see inside, to find some luck in the story, to believe it. So I have this new book um, that I just kind of wrapped up called Dog Whistle. And um, some of the poems in that book are personal poems written with political speech. Um, but nearly all of them kind of have this emotional layering, like uh, you're saying one thing, but you're also saying another thing. Um, and this first poem is called Poem by a Person Called Woman. And there's a reference to Orlando in this poem. And um, that's the name of a friend of mine, the poet Orlando White. And um, he's Navajo. And so that gives a little context to the reference poem by a person called woman. Ancient as math, bright as grass, I believe in rain as much as the next person called poet. As much as people called women in North Korea, trimming meadows with scissors, played by blade. Not today Satan proclaims the first Baptist church on North Main, but it is Satan's day, and that's not me being pessimistic. That's the sexy handmade Halloween costume top. Vichy France with tits, double agent of the patriarchy Kim Kardashian, and her husband with his MAGA hat on the verge of mental collapse or world domination. That's 
Orlando, not the tragedy of Tulsa, but the native tragedy of my friend's history, and his early morning texts, calling my coffee, which I have yet to drink, colonialism, a forced luxury like flour and wheat. I hear you, I say. I have to make my kids colonial pancakes today. We don't exist at all, he says. We will always die and die. Even I, your so-called Kavanaugh world. Ain't I a woman, I want to know? Yeah, says Orlando. You're my home. Um, you're of the murder hornet. And we have so much information coming at us all the time that you might recall like three months ago, murder hornets were in the news. My kids were like, they're coming from Japan. So that's old news by now. Um, but this is, you know, about this year. Year of the murder hornet. Year of the cloud of pollen that chased me to my car across the supermarket parking lot. Year I was overpowered by flowering magnolia petals in a windstorm while walking home. Year of the murder hornet and coronavirus and weather as a system that shaped each day in a way that felt different from the past. Year during which you understood how the neighborhood you grew up in shaped the way you say friend. How the word childhood is the start of a sentence that has no end until you aren't the one saying it anymore. Year of grown-ups with their gravity, making everything a question of a fragment, depending on their personal weather, whether some of them were green or deep as truly that you're imagining. Years when the way trees speak with each other, about each other, was more essential than the shade they gave. Year to try to live like trees, upright, yielding, seeking the sunlight and silent languages. Year I got a book in the mail about house cleaning as a joke from another poet regarding a poem of mine about life being hard and people's constant quest on the internet to make things easier. Year the cover of the book read, Introducing Your Household Heroes, Regular Products with Multiple how multiple abilities sounded more like a prediction than a capacity. Year of nights I lost sleep. Year my mind cradled me. And that um, that poet is Mary Rufel because like we have this joke where she likes this poem of mine, Life Hacks, and um, so she oh, she sends me these books that she finds at like Salvation Army on house cleaning. Uh, so I also have um, in this book um, some poems that are essay poems. I really like the writer Lydia Davis, and I have this giant book of essays. I like her spareness. Um, so I've just been kind of thinking about the poem as a process of thought. So one of these essay poems is Essay on Gentrification. And um, this I dedicate to the poet Tongva Isaac Martin, who's a friend of mine. And he is a native of San Francisco and is concerned with issues around gentrification. And as a native New Yorker, you know, I think about that too. And um, I'm half Chinese, so this, and half white, and so this poem is also a little bit about halfness. Essay on gentrification. Gentrification means I have arrived in a manner only half foreseen, as half of me claims culprit or as lays claim to my neighborhood and street, standing shambles to the ramblings of my education, meaning I know all about espresso and the benefits of expression, meaning I still trip myself up, render myself mute as reflex to tradition. For a long line of providing comfort constitutes survival prior to mine. If property is still an interest to protect, it also interests me in other ways, meaning I spend my days sweeping the floor, sometimes writing, sometimes imagining a table strewn with pheasant and clattering plates where a feast takes place in my absence, where plans for repaving move forward without my input or my permission, as I envision the wave of a hand prompting someone to pass the bread, to someone who likes their wine cool, their butter soft and lightly salty, someone akin to me who warms each pat with her breath, a hint of bitter ancestry. This one's called Ukraine of My Imagination, and um, keeping in the kind of political purpose.
personal realm. If you remember back when Ukraine was in the news, Zaria Ivanovich was the ambassador to Ukraine. Donald Trump at one point said something like, you know, she's not going to leave. Uh, she's going to go through some things. And uh, so that's where that phrase is. Ukraine of my imagination. I was going through some things, a cache of love letters, old impulse control paperwork, gum wrappers and a mint that tasted like pee. I was wearing my flavor blasted glasses and gazing at the skyline, plain, indefined, at night. I was recalling the fact that ash makes the most glorious sunset, something I once read in a science journal in the waiting room at the dentist. A piece of information so ephemeral and alive with possibility it corresponded with my subconscious, primordial, and sweet American crude. But I wasn't in the mood to go that deep, if only to keep grief at bay. Sometimes we say what we say because the earth has given up on us, and we know it. Sometimes I say what I say because I'm not ready. I wrote this poem last week, so I really haven't read it at all. <laughs> um, essay on States. Not united, but the ambient kind, like surroundings, or like jazz. Coltrane, the heart's improvisation, meaning crying is a form of music. Joy of delectable blues. Every organ a body with its own aria, whether reverence or ludoverci. States vary. In space, time has to do with how you move through it. In life, my dead said mine was a trial by fire. The whole thing, I exclaimed. I don't know, he said, shaking his head, as I watched my form enter the room of form. How does the end of the universe make you feel? A cosmologist on the radio was asking her colleague as I merged into a ring of cars. Impossible, was the answer I shouted. Three out of four vehicles, the exact same model and make. It turns out the cosmologist colleagues had mixed feelings about the end of things. Like any of us, the laws of physics were purportedly different early on, back when things were in a denser state and everything was like love or a black hole. A black hole being a zone where light can't escape, love being a time and space outside. And just one more essay poem, and then I'll wrap up. This one's um, essay on beauty or behold the true story. And um, I reference uh, this phrase, fuck the bread. There's this really great essay in the Paris Review not long ago called Fuck the Bread. I can't remember the exact date that we have there. Um, essay on beauty or behold the true story. There once was a man who claimed he couldn't watch Bonnie and Clyde because Faye Dunaway too beautiful. It's true beauty hurts, but it's seldom debilitating. Overrated may be the way Meryl Streep is overrated in the eyes of a man who doesn't find her beautiful enough. Fuck the bread, a writer's mother once said when her daughter couldn't find a teaching job or yeast during a pandemic. The bread is over, she told her, dismissing life as we knew it in one fell swoop. Bread became language to my mind, no longer elastic and plain, all leaven and lost, as bread became love to my heart, a knot of needy and mean. Another true story is that I am a mother and a writer who knows about beauty and bread, about language and interruption. I also know the mirror only tells part of the story of the face. The eyes have it, they say, but the eyes can only hold so much the way a heart can be full and at the same time broken, different chambers of a single system split, the way Faye Dunaway kills beauty by being the mother of it, how we break bread to partake of it. And um, I'm gonna finish off with one last poem from this book, Body of Work. And it's about my youngest son, who is much in love with me again. And he's now 10, but when he was little, um, he used to ask, where was I before I was born? And I always used to say, you were naked and flying in the wind in the sky. 
And um, so that's about that. And um, there is a reference to Trayvon Martin in this poem, which is a phrase that I borrowed from Dennis Smith, which is, um, go out for sweets and come back. And that's a reference to Trayvon going out to get sweets. Youngest son. We used to laugh and say he was naked and flying around with the stars before he came down to be with us. These days, he says, when I was dead, because naked means sexy, and he's not a baby, knows what sex is, is a bathroom bill. But I don't want the word dead around my kids or around any mother's son, so I say, honey, you were never dead. And he says, then I fell like a raindrop into your mouth, and I say, yes. So the other morning, I said yes when he called the fog a cloud on the ground. How he was formed, is forming from rain hitting the mouth, just as one day, I believe, he will go out for sweets and come back. Just like that. For some boys like him, it may be that easy to not be a cloud called back to its former place, for salt tears not to fill the space. Thank you for inviting me and thanks for listening. Thanks, Tina. Um, that's probably the best explanation, the best answer to that question about where was I beforehand that I've, that I've heard as a parent. I'm definitely gonna steal that one. Although my kids are listening, so <laughs> they, know, <laughs> they know where that came from now. Um, I'm trying to live in a clear-handed tenderness. I love that line. And I think it's, it's something that I aspire to as well. But I also aspire to be the Mary J. Blige of poetry. So. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to bring up uh, Marcus Jackson to the stage. Hey, Marcus. What's up? Are we okay with sound? Yeah, sounds, sounds clear. Excellent. Um, thank you, Ian, so much for hosting and for having us. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you, Dilruba. Your poems uh our saviors especially in times like this i'm gonna read uh a poem that i think still gives me courage and it still terrifies me uh we're, we're taught pretty early i think as people of color marginalized people marginalized people that we either aren't supposed to name our grief specifically and in many cases, we're not even allowed to explore our grief through impressionistic lenses. And this poem by Gwendolyn Brooks does both of those. It's a real short poem called The Last Quatrain of the Ballad of Emmett Till. After the murder, after the burial. Emmett's mother is a pretty faced thing. The tent of pulled taffy. She sits in a red room drinking black coffee. She kisses her killed boy and she is sorry. Chaos and windy grays through a red prairie. Those last two lines to me are one of the most eternal descriptions of America with the, the chaos and uh, the bloodshed. Uh, I'll, I'll start by just reading one poem from my latest book, Pardon My Heart. And I was trying to pick one poem to read from it. And I thought during the pandemic, delivery people have become uh, I guess more mythic or they've taken on new importance from a societal standpoint. Uh, and I do have a poem about delivering pizza. So I'll start there. This is called full-time driver. I took every hour they offered delivering lukewarm pizzas by means of an 86 LeSabre. The back tires almost bald. Managers rarely yelled or wore me out about moving too slow. When we blundered orders, 
most customers understood. My brother worked there too. He was beautiful. I should have kissed him. One good forehead kiss while such a gesture might have mattered. Women, shoeless in their doorways, gave me resigned smiles as they paid. Undergraduate smokers proposed hits of their burning herb. The richest part was when business would ebb and I'd coast the summer streets. The air felt like a cool fruit. The engine block churned a sure tune. The rear view caught moments of low moons. Time was a tame lake. My hand skimmed in the front of a canoe. And I'm gonna read four new poems from a, from a book I'm working on. Uh, this first one I wrote, trying to think about one of the earliest examples from memory, from my personal life, uh, of how easily brown people can get, can enter uh, and get trapped in the prison industrial complex. This poem's called Young Monk. I knew a boy named Sean whose mother loved successive men that charmed and tortured her. One day in ninth grade, Sean brought a luminous hunting knife to lunch and put it near the throat of the dean, who had always seemed the riest, most unmovable force as he supervised and distrusted us for no other reason than the fact that we were darker and more angelic than he. Sean, breaking a bit of skin on the side of the dean's neck, soon got choked by the officer assigned the daily patrol of our hectic first floor halls. Institutions later absorbed Sean, and I wrote him some letters each year, letters of update about certain classmates and kin, letters in which it felt impossible to plant much truth or redemption my hand and pen pausing abundantly, the blank paper like a mute field I wandered, and somewhere beyond, upon a hill that rose above roads and foliage, my friend lived like a young monk made to study decades in some state-funded monastery built in praise of the godlessness of pain. Uh, this poem, I think, does tie in as well to some of my thoughts and observations lately about the pandemic uh, in terms of if you can embrace solitude or if you're happy to embrace solitude or change what your normal quote unquote functions are on a daily basis, you'll actually be safe, um, even though of course, the government and the economy don't want you to believe that because then you can't be, you can't remain a cog in, in commerce, right? Um, so this is just a poem re-solidifying the, the beauty of solitude and loneliness. It's called A Loneliness So Pure. The world encouraged me to complete my doctorate in shamelessness. You'll hurt to not be part of all this interface and commerce, I was warned. Though, as soon as I declined, I was rewarded with a loneliness so pure that my ears could not be found by bothersome words. And my blood felt fed only by the air and the light that lives beneath the glass of greenhouses. My family, my former lovers, and the authorities tried to talk to me to sway me toward buildings whose entrances have stern signs. But I gazed patiently at everybody's face, each lit from the same failing fire. 
and I left them speechlessly, my movements constituting a new species of worryless wind. And I've got two more poems. This piece I wrote because you're expected to, I guess, grieve uh, or cry with a certain type of posture or mannerliness in, in certain sectors. This is called a type of crying. You can cry quite long in a diner without much interruption Assuming the diner is only moderately populated, the decor is outdated and immaculate, and you are capable of the type of crying during which tears do not disrupt your posture. You must hold inside a muscular sorrow and a sense of endurance for torture bequeathed to you by your shattered elders or given to you by years of grim affairs ruthless colleagues and duplicitous politicians. The diner's specialty must be a side plate of quartered potatoes, seasoned and fried in a manner that proves the cook's grasp on mortality's childless brilliance. Weeping is not possible in this scenario, unless you can invent sitting there in an upholstered booth with full visibility a revolutionary weeping that is soundless and somehow calls all the ghosts of the universe to sing their remarkable dark mouthed songs. And I'll close with this poem and thank you all for being here and thank you so much to Solstice MFA. Um, I believe I wrote this with an echo of Cornelius Edie's line, I too know the blessing of a narrow escape. I was also working on, I'm working on a long poem just about a series of escapes. This is called A Different Day's Light. 40 years into this life of escapes, my state of mind is now a cluster of field flowers dropped on a path and mostly compressed by the many guests who have left a rustic reception. Some nights I open my mouth and aim a full lunged wail toward the blankest sectors of the sky, my rebuilt molars vibrating. My usual goal is to earn an exhaustion that renders my bones leaden and stretches the centuries of argument within my head to an endless landscape of wind-blown sand. With some luck, a different day's light will wake me and encounter certain scars of mine as inconsequentially as the laws of a vanished province would encounter the back-turned ears of a running horse. Thank you. Best wishes to you all. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I forgot to say that you're in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Marcus and I go way back. I won't tell you how long because it'll date both of us. Um, I love that poem, Young Monk, and especially the line built in praise of the godlessness of, of pain that seems to get like, right to the, the heart of the, the, the problems with the, the prison system here. Um, I'm gonna bring us home with uh, Philip Williams. Philip. Philip is in Philadelphia. He's in my yes. neighborhood. I'm jealous of him. Uh, Philip e. Williams. Thank you. All right, can you hear me? Am I clear? I'll take that as a yes. Okay, the first poem that I'll, I will, I'm always, I always do that. I, I'm just so nervous to just jump in. Thank you for, <laughs> for inviting me. Ian, um, it's an honor to read with, with um, Marcus and Tina. Uh, and Dilruba. And thank you, Amber, for interpreting. The first poem I'll read is by uh, Sonia Sanchez. It's called July. The old men and women 
quilt their legs in the shade while tapestry pigeons strut their necks. As I walk thinking about you, my love, I wonder what it is to be old and shallow and swallow death each day like warm beer. I wonder what it is to be old and swallow death each day like warm beer. The first poem I'm reading will, is from my first chat book. It came out in like 2010, it's called Sway. A feather falls, gives form to wind by its movement around it. We can only wish to be this lucky, giving body meaning to what? Or swept up out into whatever inchoate pattern adds to undistinguish one thing from the next. I have no shape you have not given me. I am never held well enough that I am reminded of my life. This too frame and in it what rejects its outline, its function, despite there's no other way being defined by it. A hand because it fits the shape a hand is known for. A bell for how sway. Your mouth for how it holds my name. Sure, I can say that that you are by nature a fist full of sand, the letting go that is pageant, a city of men clinging to, then falling from disaster. I will wait for you. The next two poems are from uh, a, a manuscript in, in progress, The Void. Our dog died in the ugly disaster that is aloneness. She died on the first floor in my sister's apartment on a makeshift pad shifted halfway from beneath her. And I caught the center of her dying, the shake, the after bit tongue swelling from her mouth. My girl, good girl, she half died alone and finished with us there. My sister and I rubbed her side and she shook and blinked, then blinked no more, but breathed a slow breath as I rubbed her head, then kissed her forehead. Even in death, she was mine to kiss. She was not ugly. Much like the story of the boy from school who was shot in the head and lived to talk about it and lived to hear us all talk about it. The hole that needed the help of others to close and his neighbors around him looked into the hole in his head as if slowly realizing they'd all that time been watching a friend climb from the vortex of skin, bone, hush. The hole puckering like a fish and the head it inhabited didn't move, didn't twist, wasn't dead, but dead quiet. And I imagined the hole like a howl from a dog, like the diamonds in a chain link fence that let sight in, but not the flesh. This is the end. Do not enter or take part in what little you've been allowed to see. Howl like a warning. Howl like a plea. Do not pass. Do not step into this shape in which everything ever missing takes shape. The dog buried in the backyard. The contour of sorrow that is any boy's back darkening, then disappearing altogether from the door on his way to school, on his way coming back but he must leave first. Everything must leave before it comes back. Even the trees lining the one-way streets flanked by liquor stores bright as the mansions of devils. Even the trees must first catch fire, drop their fire, stand naked in penance as we rake their burnt garments to the gutter. Yes, even wakefulness must go toward sleep and sleep must wake. Even the body leaves and comes back as dirt, as a mind reeling into itself. A brittle recollection. Was our dog 13 or 14 when she died? When I kissed her forehead, was she already gone or still passing through? The last bit of her dying, mixing with my sister's breath, the vet appointment of no use now. I closed her eyes. It's no use, how's the entrance wound? But they fixed up the boy who spoke another language for a short time. 
the trees bowing to hear him better beyond their dancing boughs, in spite of their leaves that let in a little moth light, a little street light, so that gaps of leaf-shaped darkness gashed across his face, mouth-shaped leaves on his face, and they spoke back to the whole. We too leave, we all leave, hush, you'll come back, Lazarus, concrete Christ, a memory, a haunting, a possession like an illness, like a bullet, like a dog's eye staring back, then merely open with no looking involved, like a boy's head babbling on. Final poem for the deer. Deer asleep on the side of the road, no, Dear dead there as always, preserved in the book of symbols, dear with its flies and uncanny arrows in its side, like compass needles or fleshless wings, dear whose hooves puncture names in the snow, dear who knows your name, dear a white-tailed Gnostic in the woods, dear you get lost in. Deer with a ribbon of brass bells around its neck and an iron sword in its antlers altar. Dear emperor, watching a funeral from afar, like a crack in the vagaries of the mouth that wanted a deer to live, but instead got a pet decorated for the having. Deer in the mind taking place of the deer was always its assignment. Here, the casket carrying the father is a deer, Four cloven hooves upon the red carpet, a blown up photograph of the father's past face, a road sign saying the future is still. Boy who refuses to view his body's father, afraid of the face he will not recognize for addiction has its way with flesh. Deer casket marching out the church to where the earth is gentler to flesh, strips it patiently. Deer carrying the dead in its spine cradle, the scent of pears beckons from the bassinet of bone. The dead carrying the dead, the arrows in the deer trembling toward their cardinal affairs. The skin somehow forgot the feel of, the mama who never said goodbye, the daddy whose belly rolled on its side like a truck hit deer. There is no daddy here. The father sits up in his coffin, startled, his funeral full of his sons, which is the one son repeating like a paper cutout, a forest of sons in which the deer tilts its head into the father's grave and sips. Kind of like this. <laughs> and my final poem is from my uh, current collection called Thief in the Interior. Prayer. Help me distinguish between approaching blizzard and his breath against my ear, causing my skin to whistle like a blade of grass. Please help me keep my mind at ease when he trembles beneath me, cold, hot, and wet, wet all over. The sheets have been soaked and wrung and bleached, the carpet vacuumed, the kitchen floor swept. God, help me keep a clean home. Keep the roaches running prayers from competing with my own. Keep the rats from gnawing on the bread with filth and squeak. Plastic won't keep ice crystals from making a second pane over the window. Won't keep the don't give a damn cold from coming in and lingering beneath our feet. Give me feet that can sing, that can sing all over this floor like a drum battalion. Stump out the pests and their late night coitus. Stump out winter crawling from beneath the floorboard. Stump out the fever pouring from his never dry back. I want to heal like you do. God, let me walk on water. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, Philip. Those new poems are amazing. Um, I want to heal like like you do. I think that's a really good good note to end uh, all of your readings. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to read one more quick poem um, from a poet who, in, in good times and is bad, is, is my sort of guiding star, Lucille Clifton. 
if something should happen. For instance, if the sea should break and crash against the decks and below decks break the cargo against the sides of the sea, or if the chain should break and crash against the decks and below decks break the sides of the sea, or if the seas of cities should crash, crash against each other and break the chains and break the walls holding down the cargo and break the sides of the seas and all the waters of the earth wash together in a rush of breaking, where will the captains run and to what harbor? Thank you so much, everyone, um, for coming and, and spending this little more than an hour with us. Thank you. Uh, and if, uh, could all the poets uh, turn their cameras back on so we can, we can see you and, and say goodbye. Um, thank you so much to Dilruba, Tina, um, Marcus, and uh, Philip, thank you so much for your work. It was amazing to, to hear you all. And thank you so much to, to Amber. Um, interpreting poetry is not easy. We're, we're slippery. We poets are slippery with our language. We use it in, in ways that is, is not normal, um, that are not normal. So I, I appreciate you interpreting Amber. And thank you um, to the Solstice MFA program for helping facilitate Amber being here and, and for facilitating the, the, the platform as, as well. Again, if you're, you're interested in working on the craft of your writing, I, I do hope you'll, you'll check us out. Um, I'm gonna try and keep this up the third Sunday of every month, November, we have to take a break. Um, but otherwise, if uh, you're tired of watching football and watching people concuss themselves and wanna take a break from the football season, um, come, come check us out on the third Sunday of, of every month. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, readers.